The American cattle industry slaughters more than 34 million animals every year. Less known is that this industry harms, and often kills, individuals from hundreds of species of free-living animals. 260 million acres of western public lands, shown on the map in blue, provide important habitat for hundreds of species of free-living animals. Except for the small percentage of these lands that extend east into the Great Plains, once home to large herds of bison, the remaining area has been relatively free of large herds of large grazing animals for at least the last 10,000 years. Consequently, the vegetation and wildlife in these areas have not evolved accommodations to animals anything like cattle. Tens of millions of cattle, along with similar numbers of domesticated sheep, during the mid to late 19th century, seriously damaged the western landscape. And although the intensity of grazing has been greatly reduced from that of the 19th century, landscape degradation continues on much of this land, with catastrophic consequences for free-living animals. Before reciting the many environmental harms that ranching inflicts on western public lands, I want to dispel the notion that this ranching provides significant economic benefits to the region. Ranching provides few jobs, and even they pay poorly. And the industry can't even claim that it produces much beef on these lands. Federal public lands are not the only western lands that are ranched, but I'm focusing on these lands for a few basic reasons. First of all, this is land that by law is supposed to provide habitat for free-living animals. Secondly, when these laws that protect animals, at least in aggregates of species, are not enforced by the land management agencies, there are proven judicial remedies that can be sought. And finally, there are legislative actions that have the potential to reduce, and eventually eliminate, ranching from these lands. Although cattle grazing can by itself be disastrous for western ecosystems, grazing is not the only aspect of ranching that is detrimental to free-living animals. Roads fences, diversion of streams, pumping of groundwater, manipulation of vegetation, and of course, killing predators and competitors of cattle are lethal to individual animals and have led to the decline of their populations as species. Many species of free-living animals are so imperiled by ranching that they have been federally listed as threatened or endangered, are candidates for such listing, or have been petitioned for listing. And even though they are not so severely imperiled that they are in danger of extinction, there are at least an additional 167 animal species that are harmed by ranching through its degradation of their habitat. But let's look now at those animals that are so severely harmed by ranching that they have been given federal protection or are being considered for it. Our first victims are insects, butterflies that are dependent on vegetation that is consumed or trampled by cattle. Snails are also victims of ranching. Cattle drink a lot of water, and in the desert, one place to get it is from underground. Unfortunately, groundwater pumping lowers the water table, which then stops water flow in springs and streams. Snails who live in these aquatic environments consequently die. Snails are also harmed when they are deprived of water that is diverted from streams for irrigating fields of alfalfa. Cattle that graze on federal lands during warm months are then fed the alfalfa on the rancher's private land during the winter. Amphibians are harmed when cattle pollute streams with their nitrogen-rich waste. Acting as a fertilizer, the nitrogen promotes excessive algae growth, which in turn leads to depletion of oxygen from the water. Amphibians, as well as fish, that depend on that oxygen, consequently suffer. We'll look now at the ways in which cattle damage streams that are especially bad for fish. The sinuous nature of this ungrazed healthy stream bed from Idaho slows the flow of water, thereby minimizing the erosion of soil. Upon closer examination, we see that this stream is only about a foot and a half wide, and about as deep. The banks are stabilized by thick forbs and grasses. The water is cool and clear. Beyond the fence, cattle have removed the streamside vegetation and have trampled the stream banks. Flowing water then easily straightened and greatly widened the stream. The shallow, unshaded stream has warmer water on sunny days. As temperatures increase, the water holds less dissolved oxygen, and the less oxygen, the more sluggish the fish become. Also, without the streamside vegetation to stabilize the soil, there's much more silt in the water, which can clog the gills of fish. The removal of streamside vegetation can also lead to considerable downcutting of the landscape 
and loss of topsoil during floods is seen in this stream from Oregon. Even if fish could survive the cattle trampling of this Idaho spawning area, it is unlikely that the fish eggs would survive the heavy concentration of silt and warm temperatures, both of which will hinder the ability of eggs to absorb oxygen. In many regions, such as here in Oregon, ungrazed streams are shaded by forests of willow or alder. Such trees are essential to maintaining cool daytime water temperatures that fish require for good health. Here's the stream shown in the previous slide, but a section that has been grazed by cattle for many decades. Cattle consume the young shoots of riparian trees. Then, when old trees die off, the stream is left unshaded. Without shade, water temperatures are generally higher during the day and lower at night, resulting in greater thermal variation, which increases the stress on the immune systems of fish, leaving them more vulnerable to disease and parasites. A few slides ago, I showed an Oregon stream that had downcut five feet from the combined effects of long-term grazing and spring floods. This Wyoming stream, heavily grazed for many decades, has downcut more than 20 feet since the early 1900s. Imagine all the sediment-laden, fish-choking water that this erosion has produced. Cattle still graze along this stream, consuming and trampling the vegetation that could halt further soil erosion. This stream and the surrounding landscape in central Wyoming are among the most overgrazed areas that I've seen. Here a starving cow struggles to obtain grass from ungrazed private land adjacent to the federal grazing allotment. At least one of these animals did die, probably from starvation, and this is land that is scientifically managed by people who have college degrees and are employed by the Bureau of Land Management. Let's now look at reptiles that are harmed by ranching. Probably the best known of them is the desert tortoise, a resident of the Mojave and Sonoran deserts. The tortoise's population has declined in some areas by as much as 90% since the 1980s. Cattle damage the tortoise's habitat, depleting it of vegetation and spreading unhealthy pathogens in their waste. Trampling by cattle and sheep can collapse tortoise burrows and destroy tortoise eggs. Let's now turn our attention to birds many of whom are harmed by cattle grazing in the same ways as our fish, through the destruction of streamside trees and ground-level vegetation. Forty years of cattle grazing can so greatly alter fire dynamics that a virgin forest can be transformed into an overgrown thicket, less able to withstand drought, insects, and disease. The northern goshawk is harmed by these changes because it requires large trees in which to build its bulky nests, and the goshawk needs open space between trees in which to locate and pursue prey. Meadows that have been cattle stripped of vegetation leave voles and wood rats so vulnerable to predation that their populations crash. The Mexican spotted owl, a predator of voles and wood rats, also suffers from the cattle-altered landscape. Without sufficient prey, owls do not successfully reproduce, and their own population then declines. Healthy desert grasslands provide vegetative cover that hides ground-nesting birds from predators. Cattle-grazed grasslands provide no cover for these birds, nor for reptiles and small mammals. This healthy Wyoming grassland contains an appropriate mix of sagebrush and abundant native grasses upon which many birds depend. The long-time cattle-grazed surrounding area has shorter grass and has been encroached by sagebrush. Although birds require sagebrush for cover and forage during the winter, as well as for nesting during the spring, they also need abundant grasses for forage in summer and fall. In short, the cattle grazed ecosystem is somewhat out of whack, a factor in the decline of bird populations. Decades of overgrazing by cattle extirpates native grasses, opening the way for weeds that are useless to cattle and free-living animals. The government then applies herbicides and reseeds the area, often with non-native grasses such as crested wheatgrass as seen here. The new grass can be so unlike native vegetation that free-living animals find it unsuitable for cover, nesting, and forage. At this Idaho location, the government even planted the grass in rows, giving predators an unnatural visual advantage compared to native vegetation. In such environments, the populations of ground-nesting birds consequently decline. Many of the cattle-induced landscape degradations that harm birds and reptiles have similarly bad effects on mammals. Voles, mice, rats, and squirrels experience excessive predation due to loss of vegetative cover. 
Pygmy rabbits have declined from having their burrows trampled. Bats lose out because their nectar plants are grazed by cattle. Beavers have declined from invasion of exotic vegetation. The kit fox, a predator, has declined because its prey have been overly predated due to loss of vegetative cover. Bighorn sheep have fallen victim to diseases that are transmitted by domestic sheep. And pronghorn compete with cattle for forage on landscapes where the quality of vegetation has long been degraded by the overgrazing of cattle. I've already mentioned a few ranching practices that harm free-living animals. Here's another one, the construction and use of roads. Lynn Jacobs, in his book Waste of the West, estimates there are at least 240,000 miles of roads on western public lands grazing allotments. Road construction kills plants and animals directly. Then the existence of roads opens up areas to human activities, such as hunting, woodcutting, and off-road vehicle use. Roads are also pathways for the spread of weeds, which, as we've seen, degrade habitat for free-living animals, and leads to their deaths and population declines. Fences are another ranching practice that can be lethal to free-living animals. Here an antelope has died after becoming entangled in barbed wire, and birds become impaled on such fences. Even when fences don't outright kill animals in the way we see here, fences can thwart natural migrations, which can prevent animals from reaching food, and in times of drought or heavy snow, can prove a factor in the demise of large numbers of animals. Lynn Jacobs, in his book Waste of the West, estimates there are at least 300,000 miles of fences on western public lands grazing allotments. Then there are mammalian predators, trapped and hunted primarily by ranchers or their surrogates over many decades. The jaguar has now been virtually extirpated from the United States. Grizzlies and wolves have not fared much better. During the mid-1990s, wolves were reintroduced into Idaho, Yellowstone National Park, and southern New Mexico. Although the wolf population in the greater Yellowstone region is thriving, future management changes in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming may again reduce the population. In the southwest, the combination of highly restrictive government policies and hostile societal attitudes have thwarted the wolves' reestablishment. Prairie dogs, competitors of cattle for grass, have long been a target of ranchers for extermination. After more than a century of hunting and poisoning, the prairie dog population is now about one quarter of a percent its original size. Many animal species that have evolved dependent relationships with prairie dogs have also suffered because of their decline. The most severely impacted of these species is the black-footed ferret, much of whose diet consists of prairie dogs. Once numbering in the tens of millions, by 1986 the free-living population of ferrets had dwindled to 18 individuals. Now, more than 20 years later, the breeding program begun with these ferrets has re-established several colonies totaling about 800 individuals. Despite this apparent success, given that the prairie dog population remains so small and may yet decrease from disease, the long-term survival of free-living ferrets remains uncertain. Throughout this presentation, I've limited my topic to animals whose populations are headed toward extinction, largely because of ranching. This is not to suggest that the harms inflicted by ranching on other animals are less significant. And before concluding this presentation, I'll mention one animal that for more than a century, ranchers have tried to exterminate without success, despite killing millions of animals. It's the coyote. The government's Wildlife Services Agency kills in the 11 western states about 56,000 coyotes every year. I'd bet that most of those killings are carried out to benefit ranchers. Let's look at the variety of methods the government uses to kill coyotes. Terrestrial firearms are the single most effective method, responsible for killing almost 22,000 coyotes annually. Snares and traps are used to kill about 8,200 coyotes. And more than 3,200 coyotes are killed by poison devices known as M44s that fire cyanide into the mouth of any animal that pulls on its bait. About 400 coyote pups are killed in their dens, typically through the use of gas or with hand tools. Another really effective killing method, although a relatively expensive one, is aerial gunning, using either an airplane or a helicopter. More than 13,300 coyotes are annually killed in this way. But the method is also dangerous for the killers. Between 1989 and 2007, there were 25 air crashes, resulting in 19 minor injuries six serious injuries, and nine fatalities. 
This concludes my short overview of the harms that Western ranching inflicts on free-living animals. I encourage you to learn more about the evils of Western ranching from the half-dozen books that have been written on the topic since the early 1980s. My own book, Western Turf Wars, differs from the rest by focusing on the politics behind government actions. In particular, explaining how and why the federal land management agencies fail to uphold environmental laws that are intended to protect the free-living animals that we've just seen. I have a longer, live version of this presentation that I'd be happy to bring to a college or nonprofit organization. In this more comprehensive version, I examine the development of the cowboy myth that underlies our society's love of ranchers and cowboys. I look at the development of the myth since the 1870s through books, painting, magazines, films, music, comic books, radio, television, advertising, and politics. In this expanded presentation, I also draw upon the many interviews in my book Western Turf Wars that provide insight into the corrupt practices that permeate the federal land management agencies.